everyone, and welcome back to the Path 11 podcast with your hosts, Mike and April. We have a couple of announcements and just wanted to let you guys know that we are expanding on our social media. We now have a new account up on Instagram where you might enjoy seeing some of our pictures from our trips that we go on and uh, some pictures that we've taken at some of the screenings and just along the way. I just got back from a trip from Colorado, so I uh, was sharing some of the beauty with you guys there. And we are also on LinkedIn. Is that correct, Mike? Yep. LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Uh, Path 11 Productions. It's a company page. And we're also on Tumblr as well. So we know that most of you have probably a social media form of choice that you prefer to use. So we're hoping to reach everyone with their uh, preferred social media. So today we are going to be speaking to author Colleen Morrow, and Colleen is the founder and editor-in-chief of Intuition Magazine. Her 30 years of experience in magazine publishing includes work as a publisher, editor, advertising director, and circulation and marketing consultant. A lifelong interest in the untapped powers of the mind led to the launch of Intuition Magazine in 1988. Intuition explored the higher potential of the mind and the many and varied ways of knowing intuition, inspiration, and telepathy, providing both research and how-to information in easy-to-read form for the general reader. And we're going to be speaking with Colleen today about the book that she recently published called Spiritual Telepathy, Ancient Techniques to Access the Wisdom of Your Soul. Well, hello, Colleen, and welcome to our show today. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. We're really excited to talk about your book, Spiritual Telepathy. Um, in reading some of the information about it, one of the things that I would like to know a little bit more about are the techniques that you talk about that were once taught in the schools of Egypt, Greece, Babylon, and India, and you know how to tap into that intuition and that development. I'm not too familiar with... I guess, the history of that. So if you, you could start wherever you'd like, but I'm really cu- curious to hear more about the origin of that and how it ties into your book. Sure. Um, I, as you probably know, published Intuition Magazine in the 90s, and that was sort of a preliminary um, work for this more advanced teaching. And what we taught people in the 90s was to make friends with their intuition and to value the information that they receive for their personal life. And this is something that's um, more advanced. This is soul contact. And again, we get it, we get information and intuition, but it's from a much higher source. And we do this through the daily practice of creative meditation. And most meditation practices focus only on quieting the mind. In this type of meditation, we go a step further and we actively train our minds to transmit information from the soul to the brain. The information has to reach the brain to become part of our conscious awareness. And it's in the same way that our homes are wired for telephone and internet connection, that this type of meditation allows us to create the threads and cables that link us to the higher worlds. And we do this by projecting our attention upward to the soul day after day. It's a very disciplined practice and it's something that does have to be done every day. And we do it by visualizing the soul as a star about six inches above our head. And as we do this day by day, we anchor small threads of energy that eventually, thread by thread, form a symbolic bridge between the mind, the brain, and the soul. The bridge is called the Rainbow Bridge or the Bridge of Light in the Wisdom Teachings. It's called the Antakarana in the Hindu text, and it's called the Straight or Narrow Gate in the New Testament. I did a lot of research on this subject and discovered that the same teaching exists in all of our spiritual traditions. It's at the very core of each of our traditions, which I found really exciting and fascinating. And what inspired you to move from uh, Intuition, the magazine that you were publishing, to to this book? Well, I was introduced to the topic by a friend and colleague, and I was instantly captured because I could see this is the next step, this is the more advanced level. And I just started reading everything I could on the subject. And a lot of it was esoteric books that are really hard to get through. It actually took years to read that. And I thought very carefully about how I wanted to present this information because it is very esoteric. And I wanted it to be read by an audience beyond those that usually read esoteric books. And I knew that I had to position it as a universal teaching 
that exists in all traditions and show that the science is now backing this up to make it credible for that wider audience. So it actually took years to do it with all the studying and writing. But I was just um, propelled forward. I just fell in love with the topic. I knew it was the time to get this out. And um, I just couldn't stop. I knew it was not a great career move for me to spend years on it, but um, I'm really glad I did. Yeah, and what kind of brought you to this, you know, as as an adult? What's your background story? Uh, my background is magazine publishing. Uh, I have a good story about how the magazine got, Intuition Magazine got started. Do you want to hear it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, people love the story. Um, I was in San Francisco, and I was working for several alternative magazines. I actually ran West Coast offices for East Coast magazines like um, New Age Journal and The Whole Life Times and so on. At that point, San Francisco wasn't really a great place to have a career in magazine publishing. So I considered myself really lucky to have gotten these plum jobs. And it was 1988, and I was between jobs, and there was nothing on the horizon. And I figured that my luck had finally run out, and I was going to have to move, which I didn't want to do. And um, I spent my days researching new magazines and pretty much driving myself crazy about my dwindling resources. And one morning I woke up and I decided that I needed to take a break just for my mental health. And I would treat myself to one worry-free day outside working in my garden. And I wouldn't think at all during that day that I didn't have a job and that I was running out of money. And I was standing in the garden when a thought suddenly flashed through my mind. And the thought was the Center for Applied Intuition. It was a organization that I knew about. And I was really just literally stopped in my tracks. It wasn't the kind of familiar intuitive experience where I access information through feelings or some sort of body sensation, like a queasy stomach. This was a, pur a purely mental experience. The words seemed to have been dropped directly into my brain, and I immediately knew that it wasn't my thought, and it certainly made no logical sense. I had met the founder, I had talked to him several times, and I couldn't imagine why I would be sent there to look for a magazine job. What he did, he had a tiny two-room office, and he did intuition trainings, and he sent out um, expert intuitives to help businesses. So um, magazines didn't seem to factor into what he did at all. So I thought about it for a few days. Even though it didn't make any sense, I decided to call him, and I asked him to send me information about the center's activities. And a few days later, a large manila envelope arrived, and I dumped it out on my dining room table. And there were several brochures in addition to a very simple typewritten journal called Applied Sci. And this was a quarterly publication that he sent out to the members. I think there were about 200 at that time. And the subject was intuition and creativity. And I was fascinated by it. And as I flipped through the pages, I suddenly had an idea that with a new name and a, and a more upgraded format, this could be a real magazine, a national magazine that would be of interest to an audience far beyond the 200 that he was sending it to. So I called him, made an appointment, and the more I thought about it, the more sense it made because it really married my interest in the intuitive arts with um, my experience in magazine publishing. It seemed like the perfect experience and opportunity for me. So when I got there, I explained my idea, and he just completely lit up and told me that he had always dreamed of turning Applied Sci into a real magazine, but the right person had never come along. I went home, banged out a proposal, and came back the next day, and we titled it Intuition, a magazine for the higher potential of the mind. And since he had only two rooms, I set up shop at my dining room table, and I begged my writer friends to contribute free articles. I had virtually no budget. And I sold advertising to pay for the printing, and I sent up set up a local uh, bookstore distribution, and I trucked the copies around in my car. And within a week, they had all sold out, and so I knew I was really on to something. And then I decided to set up a national distribution network. And it was about that time that um, Bill decided to close the center. He signed the rights um, to the magazine over to me. And I later received a grant, which allowed me to set up an office and hire staff. And when I think about it now, there's two really remarkable things about this story. One, I never could have gotten there through the rational mind. I'd always dreamed of starting my own magazine, but I couldn't have imagined that I'd be a candidate at that point since I was barely paying my rent. And I also couldn't have seen that in the next decade, there would be an absolute flood of information on the subject of intuition. And the magazine really created a focal point. 
And it's said in the wisdom teachings that you don't really need to know anything beyond what your next step is. And I think this is a good illustration because I was just putting one foot in front of the other. I had no idea what was going to come. But it all worked out in a, in a really beautiful way, and suddenly I had my own magazine. So I, I made the crucial decision to call him, and I might not have because it didn't make any logical sense at all. But I thought, well, what the heck would I have to lose? And um, it all unfolded from there. Yeah, that's definitely a great story. And I like what you said about um, you know some of the spiritual teachings talking about how you really don't need to know what it is that you're doing, just kind of putting one step in front of the other. And mm -hmm. do you have techniques within your book that it, are the techniques, are they helping people to kind of calm that mind, that overactive mind that we have and the planning and the future planning and trying to figure out, you know, what is our purpose? What am I supposed to be doing here? And then trying to create this whole plan. Do you want to talk a little bit more about sure. that? Sure. Sure. It's the contact with the soul that really makes it clear what our higher purpose is. The, the soul is the repository of all of our lifetimes of wisdom, and it's our best source of guidance, our best and highest source of guidance. And in the book, I created a step-by-step -step process. There's actually 12 meditations in the book, and there are several additional practices. One of the first things that we have to do is to refine the physical, emotional, mental bodies. This is important because we need to create a direct line of communication between the soul, mind, and brain. If we don't have a quiet mind and emotional body, the information doesn't get through. And I had a lot of problem with this. When I um, really got serious about quieting myself down, what I discovered is that I had huge amounts of anger and resentment and um, lack of forgiveness in my life that made it hard. When you get quiet, anything that's unresolved starts to bubble up. And Jack Kornfield talks about this too. When he first started to teach meditation, he discovered that at least half of his students were unable to master even the basic concentration exercises because they had so much unresolved emotional issues. And um, I decided at one point, I was getting so frustrated, that I started working with a healer. His name was Stephen Lumiere, wonderful man. And he gave me a prescription, basically. And he told me to do three meditations, three times a day, on compassion, on forgiveness, and loving kindness. And over time, my emotional body started to calm down, and I started to make a deeper connection to the soul. So that's really the first step for everybody. And I have, I think, about five or six of these basic meditations. Before we actually get into the bridge, the bridge building, there are three meditations progressive meditations that allow us to create this bridge between the mind and the soul. And again, the information has to reach the brain or we don't have conscious awareness. Now, for the book, you did a lot of research on ancient and modern spiritual cultures and traditions. Mm -hmm. How does science validate that? Well, it's interesting. Um, if you read, especially the, the pioneers of quantum science, if you took away the names and just read what they said, it sounds like you're reading a text from a wisdom teaching. And they were just knocked out by some of the things that they discovered. When they investigated matter at the subatomic level, they discovered that matter is not separate or solid. It's um, fluid and interconnected. And they were absolutely astonished by this. And many of them turned to the Eastern traditions to try to understand what they had discovered. And so you have David Baum and other people of that era who were the ones to actually create this theory. And it's been taken up by our modern um, scientists like Dean Radin and uh, Rupert Sheldrake and so on. And so they're saying basically the same thing, that everything's interconnected, that there's a universal mind and somehow we're hooked up to this. And um, again, if you take away the names and just read what they're saying, it could come straight from an esoteric text. And this is a very exciting time for, for us to see the wisdom teachings and science come together. Now, with the different meditations that you have laid out in your book, is there anyone in particular that maybe you'd like to uh, describe to the audience or take them through a little more in depth? One thing I did for another interview was talk about um, a, a forgiveness meditation. 
Mm. And that was absolutely essential for me because I had so much anger at several people that I couldn't calm down until I found a way to really forgive. It's so easy to forgive when you can sit down and talk to somebody. It's harder when you can't. And they tell you if you have a problem with them, you're the problem. So I did several forgiveness exercises, and I'm going to pull up the one that I found the most helpful. Okay, great. It's called Standing in Their Shoes. Let's see. And this turned out to be one of the best of uh, the techniques that I found, and probably the very best forgiveness technique. And what we do is we consciously identify with the person that's angered us. In meditation, we imagine that we're stepping into their shoes and we're seeing life through their eyes. And when we do that, it's easier to understand why they act the way they do. Stephen Lumiere said, people only act according to the amount of love, will, and intelligence that has been allotted or cultivated in them at any one time. And they're victims of these forces and they can't act any other way. By identifying ourselves with them and seeing the world as they do, we gain insight into what they do, how they do it, why, and we realize that they can't be any different. And so this technique involves just quieting yourself down for 15 minutes, closing our eyes and following the breath in and out for a count of 10. And then imagine the person you need to forgive standing in front of you. And if it's easier, you can imagine them in their own environment, their home or their office. And we imagine that we've stepped into their shoes and we're now looking out at the world through their eyes. And we take a few minutes to imagine what life might be from their perspective. We think about their past, the forces that have made them what they are today, their challenges, their fears and insecurities. And we think about how we would act if we had the exact same of circumstances, the same limitations, the same difficulties and the same fears. And when we're ready, then we come back into our own bodies and we imagine the person we need to forgive standing in front of us and we look at them with forgiveness and compassion. We bless them and remind ourselves that just like us, they're doing the very best they can. And just like us, they have their own blind spots, wounds, and insecurities. And this was really powerful for me because there was one person that I thought I could never forgive unless we could sit down and talk things out, and that just wasn't going to happen. And when I did this meditation, it was easy to see that if I had the exact same set of circumstances, there was a good chance that I'd behave in exactly the same way. And that was a tremendous tremendously powerful moment for me, and it just felt like a burden was lifted off me. So I'd highly recommend this one for anybody that's struggling with forgiveness. Yeah, and what comes to mind is, you know, I've heard people say it, I say it a lot to my clients too, that, you know, forgiveness really isn't for the other person, it's for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I like how you described where you were able to do this meditation and to reach that forgiveness with actually not even having to be confronted with that other person, that the forgiveness was able to happen without them being present and without them being there. Exactly, exactly. And unfortunately, that's the way it happens sometimes, that we deal with people that aren't going to be able to sit down and talk with us. And right. we just have to accept that. I can also imagine that some people might have a lot of resistance to doing that meditation, you know, for people to actually want to, you know, be connected with that person to imagine what it's like to be in their shoes. I could, you know, just feel that some people would say, nope, I'm stopping right there. I can't even do that. I don't even want to imagine that person in front of me. Yeah. Um, but it, it, that that's a great a great example, and it really sounds like a wonderful meditation because it's like you had said before. It's about this connectedness of all of us being one, and that we all are doing the best that we can with what we've got. And if we can put ourselves in those other people's shoes, and that might bring about more empathy and compassion, mm -hmm. you know, for healing to be able to happen. Mm -hmm. The compassion and loving kindness meditations were also really powerful for me. Because I just started sort of letting go of my judgments and really just my heart started to open more. And that made it easy to go into forgiveness with this one particular person. And it was such a relief, absolutely such a relief. I still don't have contact with this person and that's fine. It just, it freed me. And I was very motivated to do this because I was so frustrated at my inability to quiet myself down. And I knew that I wasn't going to make any progress until I did. So I was very happy to have these exercises, and I put all this in the book. All the stuff that helped me is in the book. 
great. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, I was wondering, in kind of switching gears a little bit, do you want to talk about the three different types of telepathy? Sure. Um, this was very interesting, too, to, to understand this. The three types of telepathy are um, instinctive telepathy, and we share this type of telepathy with the animal kingdom. And uh, people in indigenous cultures still use this as communication tools. And I did a lot of research on this, and it was very interesting. It all centers around the solar plexus. And in the wisdom teachings, they tell us that that's the center for instinct and emotion, that um, that's our psychic center, and that's how we, we can sort of clairvoyantly feel other people's feelings. And in some indigenous cultures, they actually believe that there's a, a line of energy that connects um, one solar plexus to the other. That's the, the um, Huna in, in um, Hawaii. And the African Bushmen think that too, that these are lines from one person to the other, and that's how they communicate. And um, then you have mental telepathy, which is mind-to-mind -mind telepathy. And what we've discovered is that there's an additional higher type of telepathy, which is spiritual or soul-to-soul -soul telepathy. This allows us to get information from higher beings. It, it allows us to connect soul to soul with other people. And especially, and most importantly, it allows us to connect with our own soul. Also, in the book, you, you talk about being on the brink of an evolutionary leap. Mm -hmm. And that's from emerging from an animal uh, to human. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you talk about that a little bit more? Sure. It's very interesting. It, the teaching of telepathy shows us the progression of our perceptual abilities. We have the instinct of um, early man. We have the mind-to-mind, -mind, the um, intellectual intelligence of modern man. And then we have the soul-to-soul -soul kind of communication from future man. And it's important now because when we make contact with the soul, we take our first steps into the subtle worlds and we cross the boundary from human to superhuman development. And those of us who do this are the pioneers who lead the way from one stage of our species evolution to the next. And it's really essential right now. Barbara Marks Harbor talks about this, Eckhart Tolle talks about this, and it's very profound because when we make conscious contact with the soul, everything changes. We lose our sense of separateness and realize that we're part of a great universal life, the soul of humanity. And we find our place within that greater whole, and we realize that we're connected with everyone and everything. And you can imagine how the world would change if a critical mass of people made this shift. Barbara Marks Hubbard has written that those of us on Earth today are the crossover generation. We're responsible for leading the way from one stage of our species evolution to the next. Eckhart Tolle talks about this too, but in more stark terms. He writes that as a species, we have the choice to evolve or die. And they both say that evolution happens as a result of some sort of crisis that propels or forces us to make a leap forward. Toll uses the example of an amphibian who's forced to develop the ability to live on land after its habitat dries up. Our own habitat is in trouble, and we're faced with the same need now. Our world is full of conflicts. We have loose nukes floating around, weapons that can easily extinguish the human race. So we need to make that leap, not onto land, but into the subtle worlds. Also, you talk about becoming a genius. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'd like to just like to hear more of your thoughts on that, I guess, becoming a genius. Mm -hmm. That was one of uh, my favorite things to talk about and something that I, I was absolutely fascinated by when I was studying this subject. The wisdom teachings tell us that the soul is the portal or gateway to the higher worlds and that when we make contact with the soul, we have access to the universal or divine mind, which is the storehouse of all wisdom and knowledge. Um, a book called Higher Creativity was written by the late Willis Harmon. He was the former president of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and it was my all-time favorite book. I think it was published in 1984. And in this book, he looked at the biographies of artists, writers, composers, scientists, inventors, and he discovered that their greatest achievements came from an intuitive breakthrough. And I read that book again, and then I looked in the back at his bibliography, and I started checking out from the library uh, the books that he used as his original sources. And when I read the books and the full text of these interviews, I discovered that many of these people talked about their creative process in exactly the way it's explained in the wisdom teachings, that it's through the soul that they have access to a universal flow of information and inspiration. Uh, one of the books was called Talks with Great Composers, 
and it was written in the late 1800s by um, Arthur Bell. He was an American violinist living in Europe, and he interviewed Puccini, Brahms, Strauss, Wagner, and other well-known composers about the source of their creative genius. And it was fascinating to me to read and understand how consistent their experience was. Each of them spoke as the soul, as a portal to a universal source of information. And once they were connected to the soul, the ideas and images simply flowed into their brains. And I have a lot of these stories in the book. And it becomes very clear that genius is not a rare and random event, but it's an experience that each of us can cultivate. Albert Einstein talked about this too. And it was very interesting. There's many quotes that he left us. Um, for example, there comes a time when the mind takes a higher plane of knowledge. All great discoveries involve such a leap. And the mystical is the source of all true art and science. And it was fascinating to me that when he died, researchers dissected his brain, trying to understand the source uh, of his brilliance. And he probably thought that was hilarious because it's very clear that the brain is simply the receiving plate. It's not the generator of the experience. It just receives and allows us to utilize the information. So he, um, he made it pretty clear where his information came from, but still people study the brain because it's really the only tangible physical thing that can be studied. You mentioned there was a bunch of stories in the book about it. Uh -huh. Do you want to, can you talk about one? Sure. Pacini explained to Abel that the great secret of all creative geniuses is that they possess the power to appropriate the beauty, the wealth, the grandeur, and the sublimity within their own souls, which are a part of all things, and to communicate those riches to others. He said that the conscious, pur purposeful appropriation of one's own soul force is a supreme secret, and he experienced inspiration as a divine force, a vibration that passes from the soul center into my consciousness, where inspired ideas are born. And Wagner and Strauss and Brahms also said something very similar. And I also did a little more digging and found out that um, this is true for writers and visual artists. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson explained in his 19, excuse me, 1844 essay, The Poet, that, quote, it's a secret which every, little, every intellectual man quickly learns, that beyond the energy of his possessed and conscious intellect, he's capable of a new energy, a great public power on which he can draw. By unlocking the human doors, he's caught up in the life of the universe. And Allen uh, Ginsberg, the beat poet, had this exact experience while reading the mystical poetry of William Blake, and I put his, his little story in the book. He said, I had the impression of the entire universe filled, filled with light and intelligence and communication, kind of like the top of my head coming off, letting the rest of the universe into my own brain. There was a sense of an internal father, completely conscious, in whom I had just awakened. I had wake, awakened into his brain, or into his, into his consciousness, a larger consciousness than my own. It was the consciousness of the entire universe. So this is exactly the way it's described in esoteric books, that when we ask, access the soul, we have access to this higher world that can just flow down into our brains. And Leonardo da Vinci talked about this too. He said, the painter's mind is a copy of the divine mind. The painter has a universe in his minds and hands. Where the spirit does not work with a the hand, there's no art. I also found it in the business world. Um, one of the founders of a great le electronics company has said that his extraordinary success was due to his ability to access kojin, which is a Japanese word meaning the root or origin of universal energy. And he actually had all his executives sit down and, and do meditation so they can attune themselves to the wisdom of the universal mind, and he considers that the secret of his success. And then we have um, Isaac Newton and, and Einstein, which I've already mentioned. So I found this again and again and again. All these people we call geniuses, business geniuses, writers, artists, composers, scientists, they all talk about the same exact experience. So it's not something that just happens to special people. It's a, it's a skill that we can cultivate, and we can imagine what we can do for the world if we have this ability. Now, do you feel like this was your experience in writing this book? Do you feel like you opened up uh, yourself to that oneness and kind of downloaded information? Yes, especially towards the end. 
I really just got higher in the kite. I was asking for the information. And truthfully, it's a slow process building this bridge. It takes a lot of discipline. It takes a day-to-day -day kind of um, discipline of sitting down and doing it every day. And one thing I've noticed and other people have told me is that when you stop, even for a few days, the energy starts to dissipate. And so um, I was asking for information to just flow in over and over and over. And towards the end, it really did. It actually made it hard for me to sleep. I think I was kind of um, over meditating, which can happen because it's very stimulating to the brain. But I did feel like I had information just flowing through me and it was absolutely wonderful. I, I've always had a theory about genius and like with these, especially with these composers and artists. My daughter plays the piano and she goes, you know, for lessons every week. And of course, you know, the teacher wants her to practice every other day, at least for 20 minutes to a half hour. And of course, you know, being a kid, she wants to go out and play, but we were like, no, you really should be practicing your piano. And she says, well, why do I have to practice my piano? And I said, I kind of just said my theory to her that it's not so much learning the notes. It's just being in comfortable in front of the notes so you think less. Mm -hmm. And you're more of practicing of less thinking and just let it flow through you. I, I, I kind of simplified it for a, you know, a kid, but that idea of, I guess, just letting it go and not getting in the way kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. Now, what kind of feedback have you gotten from some of the readers of the book? People love it, absolutely love it, and they say they can't put it down, and that's really wonderful for me to hear. Um, many times I thought, oh, geez, this is... This is too hard. It's taken me too long to do this. It was a terrible decision financially. But I just kept, I felt propelled to do it. And so I'm really happy when people say that they love the book. It's very inspiring. And I wanted it to be a how-to because so often esoteric material is presented in theory only. And so it's fun to read, but then you wonder kind of what to do about it. I actually became a student in the Arcane School. It's a multi-year esoteric training program, anywhere from 8 to 13 years, depending on how fast you go. And so I incorporated some of that into the book. Um, they say that you have to be really careful what you put out to the public because these practices affect the subtle bodies, which in turn affect the physical body, and you have to be ready. You have to upgrade your, your um, vibration, basically, to be able to incorporate this higher energy that comes from the higher levels. And so I... I made a very conscious choice to do what I thought was very safe, but that would give people a, an experience of it. And so they would maybe want to um, investigate it more deeply. It's made a huge, huge difference in my own life. Huge um, difference. Can you, I was just going to ask you that, how has, you know, putting this practice to work affected your everyday life? Well, when we do this meditation, um, at the end, we ask that soul light pour down over our, lo our lower bodies. It calms our mind and emotions. It uh, invigorates the physical bodies. And it's that daily connection with the light of the soul that raises our vibration and I think speeds up our evolution. Because of that and because all the work I had to do on my emotional body, I just have so much more peace and joy in my life. I have a more consistent so source of guidance and a greater understanding of the contribution I could make to the world. It really is that daily experience of making contact, building that bridge little by little, that um, really changes everything. And now that you've written this book, are you doing any book signings or what's the next project? And are you still working on the Intuition Magazine? No, I folded Intuition Magazine um, around 2001 and jumped into this project. And yeah, I do a lot of book signings. I'm doing a lot of interviews. I'm going to start actually teaching, doing lectures and workshops in various places. Well, that's great. Will you be teaching some of the meditations that you have in the book, or will the workshops be off of this book in particular? No, I definitely want to teach the meditations. And are you working on a follow-up book? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. I actually have no time. I didn't realize that um, book promotion is a full-time job, so I'm really busy with that. I like to do a workbook, and that's the next project, which will really help people keep track of their progress, keep track of the information they receive. It just seems like it would be easier for people if they had that sort of structure. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think putting it into even more of a form where people can practice it and just kind of give it more substance and take people along in a group setting, a lot can happen there. Mm -hmm. I think that this is really the tip of the iceberg and that in the next few years, this, this whole subject matter is going to explode. And I saw that happen with the intuition work where it was it started as a trickle and then just became this huge, huge movement. And there was tons and tons of books and tapes and classes and, and everything. It was considered the buzzword of the 90s. I remember reading that in uh, USA Today. And so this is the next piece. People are ready for this now. Part of the intuition work was just to help people reclaim uh, what we lost when we started relying more on the rational mind to give us information. Because that information is still there. That way of knowing is still there. It just kind of goes below our... Um, our conscious awareness, and it's it, it talks to us in our gut feelings and so on. And I found it very interesting to see how accepted this is now. In the past, um, it was sort of written off as women's intuition or something just that artists just did, and it was kind of flaky, and nobody prominent would ever admit to making a decision based on their intuition. And now it's everywhere, and it's in the political world as well. I remember uh, George Bush saying that he was a gut player, you know, and his his gut feelings uh, played into his decision to evade Iraq. And um, Michael Chertoff, his Homeland Security person, talked about publicly in a news conference that he had a gut feeling that we were going to be attacked one summer. I think it was 2007 or so. And I was fascinated by this because um, he was making that public statement, which it would not have happened 10 or 15 years ago. It would have been considered too flaky. But now it's everywhere. And because it's everywhere, it's time to take the next step. Have you been surprised by your own intuition uh, developing, increasing, or getting more accurate? Yeah, I have. I have. And again, that it's um, the information from the soul, which is a higher level of information. The soul is our divine partner, and it's our purest sense of guidance. And um, I have a more, a more complete understanding of what I can do, what my piece is to do. And in fact, there's a whole... Um, section, the last chapter in the book is called Become a World Server, and it's how contact with the soul can really put us on our path, can really show us what our service is in this particular lifetime. And I have a lot of stories uh, about people who've had this experience, and there's another, the last uh, meditation really is to make contact with the soul and ask, what is our, our service? Now, do you have any workshops that are already set up that you'd like to let our audience know about if they are in the area where you're going to be? Mm -hmm. I am doing one in uh, January in the San Francisco Bay Area. It'll be for East West Books, which is in Mountain View in Silicon Valley. I'm working on setting other things up, but nothing's been confirmed yet. All right. And where can people find your book? <clears throat> uh, probably the best and the cheapest place is Amazon. Wonderful. They and Oh, go ahead. They can go to my website, which is spiritualtelepathy.net, and they can read the introduction to the book and uh, reviews and see my schedule. And there's direct links uh, to Amazon through the, through the website. If you'd like more information about our films or to purchase our DVDs, you can head on over to our website at thepastseries.com. They're also available to purchase on amazon.com. Our films are also streaming online at Vimeo.com, GuyMTV.com, and iTunes. If you have a show suggestion or would like us to interview someone specifically, please feel free to shoot us an email at info at thepastseries.com or send us a tweet at the past series. Please rate and review us in iTunes and subscribe. We hope you enjoyed the show. <laughs>